Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Today I'm joined by Redskins quarterback Dwayne Haskins. Also, it's a Therapy Thursday podcast mailbag edition. You know what that means. And then Chef Mel joins me for some barbecue talk. But first, my conversation with Dwayne Haskins. Now, to set this up, just know that this was taped around 10 days ago and it was for a story I wrote on ESPN.com about his development. A few things, of course, have changed since the interview, but this was about what he was doing to get ready and his thoughts on seeing other rookies have success at quarterback. The general feel still applies, so I wanted to share it with you, and I think you'll like it. Also, at one point, receiver Jehu Chesson shouts something to Haskins as he walks past. Chesson, as you remember, as you know, went to Michigan. You'll hear Haskins reply to him on the interview. Now, here's Dwayne Haskins. see how things going because I know like a big part of this season is, is you developing and you know even if whether it's on your own or on the field whatever so I'm just curious like for you what are some of the things that you what have you been doing extra to, to get yourself to where you want to be? Uh, like you said it's doing the extra work um, watching extra film doing stuff in practice uh, stuff in the weight room um, extra stuff in the training room getting with Hutch and just you know trying to you know establish a routine for myself that I can do for years to come and you know just trying to figure it all out when you're out on the practice field with the scout team and I was talking to Terry about this the other day he's like he goes he's starting to watch you now kind of like tear thing some more things up out there do you start are you start and even like Tim was saying that you know they're they are working with you on that it's not just scout team that's your time to get some reps too how is that part been going for you and do you notice a difference in yourself out there uh scout team is tough because it's not your plays right um, you know defense already has an idea what you're going to do so they're they're jumping stuff, they're trying new stuff out, and uh, you're trying your best to be as accurate as possible because uh, you don't know what the reads are, it's going off of what you think will be open, and um, you know, I do try to make the best of it, but uh, you know, just whenever I get a concept where it's similar to what I do, I just try to, you know, match it up. Then, do you work on things like your footwork on that and that stuff? Is that kind of what you, is? what are you trying to accomplish in those? Uh, I'm just trying to just maximize the reps, um, I don't get a lot, and uh, you know, just trying to figure out um, how to make the plays work um, just so that I can keep continuing to get better and make it realistic for myself. How many reps would you get in a practice, typical practice? Uh, like 20, 25 plays. Is that including scout team or just regular reps? Uh, just scout team. Okay. Um, I don't get any reps with the right. actual uh, offense or throw routes and stuff like that, but that's uh, just on the air. So, yeah. So before practice, are there things you do? Because I know like, we talked about this in August too, um, things that you do before practice. What are you, some things you're doing extra before practice, after practice to kind of help? You know, just um, working on um, just footwork, quick game, um, taking drops on the center, uh, trying to throw those as many guys as I possibly can that are playing, and um, getting guys out to practice throwing to them too. And, uh, you know, they're trying to uh, make the best out of the situation. And you see, I mean, how how are you handling? Because that's like I would imagine it's not easy. You can be patient. Everybody says, "Oh, be patient," but I know somebody told me, you know, "I'm 20 some years old to be patient." It's like well, I yeah. don't want to be patient. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's hard. Um, you know, but uh, at the end of the day, you gotta you know think about the bigger picture and um, where you want to be, and you know, hope that happens. So. Yeah. How much different? How much better do you feel even from a month ago with what you know and what you've learned already? I feel, I feel pretty good. Um, you know, um, just trying to just trying to keep getting better. And um, you know, it's hard when you're not playing with the guys that you're gonna be playing with in the actual game. But um, you know, just trying to find a way and not making any excuses. And um, you know, I'm just trying to be as uh, seasoned as, as possible uh, as far as knowing what I'm doing, knowing my reads, knowing my flips uh, for protection, knowing the, the keys and stuff like that and mastering the game plan each week and um, you know just trying to uh, 
by myself. I remember talking to you after the last preseason game, and you just seemed like there was a. It seemed like you were different, even from after playing in four preseason games, yeah. than you were going into with some of the stuff you knew. And I can't remember there was like a play you could spit out like that, yeah. where it's like, and you said it just like if you were feeling more like instead of just calling the play, you were understanding the play. Yeah. How do you feel you are in that? Area? Uh, definitely. Uh, the more you hear it, the more comfortable you get with it, and um, you know just. Hearing how they talk as far as the coaches and the terminology and stuff like that, it gets easier every day because you're, you're hearing the same stuff. And, you know, uh, it's different from trying to remember off of memorization instead of just remembering off of knowing it, like the actual concept and being able to match it up with the, the formation and the protection and the tags and stuff like that. So um, definitely get better with that. Do you? F how close do you feel like to, to where you want to be? Um, I don't know if I ever get where I want to be. I'm, I'm like... But you know where you can be when you're feeling like I can be doing yeah, half no, I, mean, I, I know I can play well and I know I can do it at a high level, but I want to keep getting better. I feel like I can be really, really good and I want to be a great quarterback and one of those guys we can talk about for years to come. And, um, you know, that's not going to happen overnight and I, I know that and I've told you that multiple times. Absolutely. So, and, and, and that's because yeah. it's funny because when they drafted you, Doug, Doug Williams was like, yeah. you know, we're going to be patient and he has to be patient with himself. Mm -hmm. And he is, you know, that I would, like I said, I would imagine that's really hard to be. Yeah, I mean, the difference between being, like, patient and then um, not, like, working, you know. Right. Um, I'm, I'm hungry, I want to play, and that's just, as a competitor, that's how you want to want to operate. But, um, you know, you want to be in the best situation to succeed. And, Absolutely. Um, that's just um, what I'm waiting for. And But if, if you had to go in right now, uh -huh. how do you feel? I feel good. I feel like I can help the team win. And, you know, I'm just ready, just ready in case anything happens. And um, if it does, I'll have my... Have myself ready, and um, you know, just whenever the team needs me to play, I'll make sure that I'm, I'm ready for that. It's funny because it looks like this offense is well suited for what you do too. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, and there seems like there's some similar concepts you use in college, but some of the mesh and, and you know, some of the deep stuff too which seems to fit your strengths. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like the the concepts and stuff that they do offensively. I feel like I can I can um, I've done it before, familiar with it, and um, you know, I like I like our receivers a lot and. You know, just um, just trying to get on the same page with uh, Jay and Kevin and Tim and just what they want out of certain plays. And all three of them are different in how they coach and mm -hmm. just trying to be able to decipher um, all the different languages. Like, they all, they speak the same language, but they don't talk the same. <laughs> right. It's weird, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's how it is. So, what is it, like, what's the, what are one or two things where you say, I've gotten a lot better here, or maybe one or two things you say, I've got to get better here? Yeah, this is just going to be over time. Um, right. There's not anything I feel like I have a particular weakness in. It's just a matter of just um, getting the reps and getting the opportunity and, um, you know, just keep getting ready for that moment when it comes to be ready for it. And, um, you know, I just want to keep getting better at everything with my body. And I feel like I'm getting in great shape and cutting my body fat down and studying my plays hard and knowing my concepts and um, knowing the game plan and, and staying a little bit after after practice or meetings and, you know, getting up earlier to come in and lift and chatter, Jake, and you know, it's just all the process. What time do you get here in the morning? Uh, like six thirty. Really? So and that you go in here to lit, work out right away like that? No, I'll work out and then I go in and watch film and then we'll be at eight. So. And then and then after practice, how long would you stay just to do some extra stuff? Um, after practice, I'll um, do like some rehab stuff with Jake in there as far as like shoulder stability and stuff like that, and I'll get in the sauna and then, um, again with the uh, Hutch and the the performance room and do something for my legs and watch film again and then I'll stay a little bit after and like call the kids talk and then I go home and watch myself. So yeah. from practice until you watch but like what time are you done at night watching yourself? Uh, I don't watch myself. Um, I don't know, I like whenever I get tired. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, I get home and I got dogs and I just chill. So. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um is it is it hard to watch? Because like Daniel's now starting, Kyler's uh -huh. playing, Gardner Minshew's out there playing. Is it hard to sit there and not be in that same spot? No, I'm not. I'm happy for those guys, and um, I know all those guys too great. I met them throughout the process mm -hmm. and all that stuff, and um, you know, um, it's easy to just look at the rookie class and, and be like, rookies are playing. Why? Why am I not playing? And, you know, I want to be like Tom Brady and the Drew Brees, and that's something that happens. It doesn't happen overnight. So right. Tom did play at first, Aaron Brady and uh, Aaron Rodgers oh, at first. 
We're going to talk about that team over here. Uh, <laughs> Terry already quieted him down yeah. in training camp. Uh, he doesn't win against us anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, everyone has a different story. Everyone has a different, um, you know, path and, and um, journey. So, um, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's good for them. And uh, that's the situation I worry about Mark. After Daniel got named the starter, people kind of saw your tweet about sheesh. And I don't know if it's related or not, but people took it that way. <laughs> yeah. what, what was that? <laughs> Oh man, I was with my dad. We had some good food, <laughs> and then um, of course that came out. And like, I like somebody's tweet saying that maybe he was just chilling, and I was just chilling. Don't, don't but, rush. Um, I saw that. And, you know, that's crazy. I grew up. I can't say it not because I'm a Redskins, but I grew up a fan of Eli, so um, I definitely uh, thought he had a great career. And um, you know, I'm just wishing him the best of luck in his future, and then, um, you know, hope he does well. Two more guys want to Terry McLaurin. <laughs> Any surprise by you? at what he's done so far? No, I don't know. And why not? I watched Terry play for three years and we got better every year. He's one of the most unselfish guys I've played mm -hmm. with and most receivers are usually all about me and mm -hmm. he's not like that at all. And um, like I, someone else asked me that question, like I had great receivers at Ohio State, all of them yeah. are NFL type of receivers and um, all of them do something different that makes them, makes them different. And um, I just felt like Terry, somebody that I can play with this because he's going to block, he's going to run into route hard, he's going to be there when you need him to be there, and we have great timing, we're sick with one another, and he's a good dude, so um, I wanted him to be on my team if I had an opportunity to, and, um, you know, we're not. He seems like a better route runner than he was in college, so even he feels like that. I don't know, do you see that? Um, it's hard, man. Terry's responsibility in college is more of a burner type of guy. Right. Um, we had him, we had Paris, we had KJ, we had Johnny, yeah. we had Austin. And young guys behind Mojave and yeah, it was, yeah, it was a lot of guys so like each guy had their own role and people were like how come Terry didn't have 70 catches like Paris because Paris is more of our slot guy right. he caught more of the bubbles and the bombers and the mesh routes and right. stuff like that and Terry was our deep threat so um, he can do all those things if you wanted him to do what Paris did or right. or what Johnny did and he can do those things but that just wasn't his role and uh, here he's asked to do everything and he does that at a high level and then Ryan, what is what did he mean to you just in your development? I meant a lot. Um, just because of his NFL background, um, his NFL concepts. He watched a lot of Eagles film, a lot of 49ers film when he was there. When he still is there, but when he when he first got in, and you know, it took him a while to adjust to him uh, being new, and um, he took it over, and he's doing a great job, and he just helped me a lot with just my preparation, um, especially going into my last year of college, and. Uh, you know, giving me the, uh, the tools and telling me how Sam dealt with mm -hmm. pressure and how the Kaepernick situation, how he dealt with that. And just great insight on stuff. It's great to talk to people that have uh, experienced stuff like that. And it just gives you uh, something to, to use for your toolbox. And uh, it's very helpful. Very last thing, and I appreciate your time. I always do. Um, during games, what's that like for you? What are you doing? And what's it like watching? What are you watching? Yeah, I just um, have my headphones on, listen to the play. And, um, do the best I can to try to watch the defense and um, read it out, uh, like if I was in the game. But uh, I'm also trying to, if um, Casey asks me if he's seen a certain play and asked what happened, I'll be able to tell him and, um, you know, write the plays down. And for uh, Evan, who's one of our guys who works right. here, and um, it's good too because I get to hear the play, repeat the play back. So it's kind of like I'm in the huddle a little bit, and um, you know. Yeah, it helps. And Tim said he talked to you sometimes about what he sees or what you want to know what you're seeing too. Is that does he do that during games? Was he able to? Uh, Preseason, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> during the season, it's probably hard during regular season. Yeah, game. but um, no, yeah, definitely. Okay. okay, cool. After this break, the doctor is in. I get to your therapy Thursday questions, including whether or not we're intimidated by Bruce Allen, and more on Dwayne Haskins' development. Okay, Therapy Thursday, the doctor is in. Let's get right to the questions. DJ Gonthier wants to know, simple question, what the hell is going on? Simple answer, I don't know. Okay, I'll expand on that for just a half a minute with Jay Gruden. You're going to hear every week <clears throat> that his job is in jeopardy and this could be the week that he's fired. Bank on that happening every week until he is fired. Eventually, somebody's going to be right. I know owner Dan Snyder is reluctant to fire a coach in season after having done so with North Turner in 2000. I know that the expectation is he will eventually fire Gruden. I wonder at some point if it doesn't just become a situation where you have no choice. 
There is frustration in the locker room, some with the coaches, some with the organization, some a lot with just the losing overall. It's not healthy. If they don't get a win soon, it'll just get a lot worse. Matt M. Swiller, M. Swiler, excuse me, wants to know, why does the Redskins media throw softball questions at Bruce Allen on the rare occasion he takes questions? Does Bruce Allen intimidate you guys? Okay, so I went back and forth a little bit with Matt on Twitter with this because questions like this get a little bit frustrating to say the least. And I don't like when people speak generically about media considering there are many, many people involved in that. We're not a single entity. We don't sit there and make our decisions together. It's we're, se- we're separate individuals and groups. So I can only speak for myself. And the last time I interviewed Alan, a legitimate sit-down interview was at the owners' meetings in March. At that time, I asked him about if he realized how fans disliked him and asked him about the hashtag, Fire Bruce Allen, and asked him about the team's poor performance under him. So I'd say, go ahead, sit across from a guy two feet away and ask those questions. And I don't know that that would seem like I was intimidated to ask those. I'm not afraid to ask the questions of him. I think there are professional ways to do so. And I think some people want us to be angry when asking them and ask them in an angry way. And that's just not how I'll ever approach my job. It's not why I think people have respect for me. It's not why people want to read me. I think they want to read me because I've done it in a professional manner and I'm not going to become across like an angry fan. Um, I also know fans get angry when people talk to Alan because he doesn't say the one, the one or two things they want to hear, which is I quit or I stink. It's not going to happen, folks. He sticks to a script as much as any person I've interviewed. He's truly a politician. I have asked for an interview with Alan almost every week since May. I have been turned down all the time. Same with owner Dan Snyder. If you have a problem with someone else's interview, I'd say you'd have to please ask them. They can, they can answer for their line of questioning. I can only answer for mine. If you have an issue with what I've asked him, feel free to fire away. Okay, next one. Redskins at Met Schoen. The only question I feel that matters for the future of this franchise, is there any indication that Dan will hold Bruce Allen accountable for the state of this franchise and fire him? At this point, I have not received any indication that he will. I explored the reasons why in our podcast last week during the mailbag session. So if you want to know more about that, please tune into that one. I also don't know what will happen if this skins finish, say, 3-13, and 2-14, and 14, whatever. I would have to imagine all bets are off because who knows what it's going to feel like in December if they're playing like that. But I don't know. And I think the only person who does know is Dan Snyder. It's amazing that Allen might have a chance to hire a third coach after having failed to win with the first two. When you're in those power positions, you usually don't get more than two. So we'll see. All right, James LaCour wants to know, to the untrained eye, Haskins didn't inspire confidence. What were the positive takeaways from his performance? And of course, he's talking about the game against the New York Giants. Let's start with let's start with the fact that Haskins was put in a bad spot entering a game down 14 nothing without their best weapon on offense, Terry McLaurin, and with two starting offensive linemen missing, in addition to those already out for the who have been out for the season. The Redskins didn't feel Haskins was close to being ready, and this is how he entered his debut. That would be tough for anyone. That's not to make excuses, but it is to say there should be no rush to judgment about him. It might take him another year to be fully ready. That's why some teams hesitated in wanting to draft him. That's why some people here hesitated in wanting to draft him. The talent was obvious. They like Haskins. I mean, they do. And this notion that Jay Gruden doesn't like Dwayne Haskins is incorrect. Dwayne Haskins has a good personality and people seem to like him. So I don't think it's anything about that. It's about who can help a guy win now. Anyway, as far as performance, there were times he held the ball too long, seemingly indecisive about what he should do. He forced some throws, a couple bad decisions. Those are things you can learn from. So that's why I say, you know, let's see how you progress from here. That's the key. Of the three interceptions, one was a bad decision to sprinkle. Shouldn't have been thrown. Okay. That became an off-schedule play for Sprinkle, so that's not on the route. It's not on him fighting for the ball or anything like that. It was a bad decision. He had a guy down the left side, Kelvin Harmon, he could have gone to on a deep back shoulder or, or a 50-50 ball. You had Chris Thompson in the right flat. It was a first down. You could have picked up five yards. you got to be a little bit better with that, with the ball in those areas. Um, another, another time he gave Paul Richardson a 50-50 ball down the side. I think Richardson probably could have run that route a little bit better. Um, but I also think that had, had Haskins, if you look the safety off a little bit more to the right, 
He had maybe Trey Quinn coming back down the left seam. That's, you know, I don't know that he would have had that. And I don't think, I also don't think that he had a chance for the time to do that with Quinn. So I think that's a big difference. So he gave him a chance and it didn't work. But when you're down that, what he was down, you're trying to attack more and that leads to decisions like that. So I just think, like I said, you got to hold the rush to judgment. The third interception was on Vernon Davis. He ran the route too deep, supposed to be about 8 to 10 yards. He ran at 11, so I'm not going to blame Haskins there. I liked Haskins' ability to extend plays, and you didn't. And you did see the arm talent on a few throws. There was one, I think it was to Davis maybe, or Richardson on the right side. Maybe, no, it was Kelvin Harmon, I believe. And he's looking down the middle, and he quickly, quickly, quickly turns to the right and just fires a bullet to, to Harmon on the right side. Just an impressive arm talent throw. Um, so I think you saw that. He was poised in the pocket. Maybe a little bit, maybe sometimes I think that internal clock needed to go a little bit faster. I think he stayed on some reads for a little bit too long. But again, experience. Those are the qualities that were attractive to teams before the draft, and they still exist. That's good. What I hear from players or from you know from players, coaches, players, agents, because they talk to their agents about this, is that you see some of the same stuff in practice. There are a lot of mistakes. You see the potential. That's why it's going to take time. That's part of the developmental process. Haskins is not going to provide instant gratification, and that's okay. Be patient. Let him develop. It's not the best match when he's paired with a coach who mu- and a staff who must win now. They are working to develop him. They're doing a lot of stuff with him. I think the key for him is to, um, let me say, somebody else asked me if they were training Haskins to be ready to start ASAP, and the answer is heck no. That's never been the desired outcome for him. The desired, more desired outcome for him is to be good enough where they didn't have to play him this year. Let him develop. Let him learn how to read defenses, and there are a lot of ways you can do that. You can put him in front of film projectors. You can put him you know, time after time after time. Just see that you know you can put you can do things with virtual rea- reality or just a film projector in a big room where you can see the defense, see how they're moving, and then okay now you know what they're in. Make it a faster decision because once you get that in this West Coast offense, it it unlocks everything because then you have the answers. The answers are out there on the routes, but you have to know the defense to and know how to read the defense to know where to then make your decision. And that's something that you can learn away from the field as well. Um, you can learn that running scout team as well because they're going to give you looks that you have to read. Okay, where should I go with the ball here? Now it's you're running off a chart and all that, but you can still make learn how to make good decisions and at least read the defense. Whether you make the you know whether somebody picks it off or not, make the right decision, and they'll that that's when you know you're starting to to get things. That to me is a huge thing because this offense. Most offenses, but this one in particular, go watch Drew Brees run the Sean Payton system. It's pretty much the same thing, but he does it with clockwork because of his ability to read defense. He's done it forever. It takes time. So just, like I said, be patient with him. The college experience mattered. Um, you know, I think that, again, the reading the defense is probably my number one focus in addition to the footwork and all that, but the defensive thing is, is big and let him get there. TM at Rush Manual, my guy, wants to know what presence, if any, does Alex Smith have at Redskins Park? Is he allowed to sit in the QB room, go over film, et cetera, et cetera? What does he, does he do any of that outside of Redskins Park? Alex is out there and will sit on meetings. I don't know how often, to be honest. I haven't seen him around there lately. We saw him earlier in the year. Um, to my knowledge, he does not do anything outside of Redskins Park with Haskins. I, I, think, I think Smith would be a lot more helpful if he were still playing. That's when a guy can get a chance to see his work as a starting seat, like when Haskins could get see him as a starting quarterback, how he prepares, how he takes notes in meetings, how he does things during the week, before the game, etc. Smith was a terrific mentor in San Francisco with Colin Kaepernick and in Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes. He's in a far different spot now. It would be very helpful for him to be here playing with Haskins, someone who knows the offense well and who also knows how to play a long time at a pretty good level. Right now, Smith is like another coach, and there are a lot of guys who have knowledge that can help Haskins. Yeah, I do agree, though, with your sentiment that there are a lot of things outside of Redskins Park that Haskins is going to have to do on his own to get better, because that's how you get better. Any good quarterback does that. It's not always responsible of the, on the coaching staff to get him there. If you're at your own job, you have a job that you have to do from 9 to 5 or whatever it is, your improvement comes after that, and that comes from the internal um, uh, stuff in, in, that comes from stuff inside you. 
and stuff you do extra on your own. I always tell my kids in a sport and whatever activity you're in, it's what you do away from the field on your own that makes the difference. And that'll be true with Haskins as well. So the coaching staff does what it can, but it has other things to do. So I agree with your sentiment, but that to my knowledge, nothing is going on there outside of there. But um, anyway, Kevin at Imperishable wants to know about Kevin O'Connell. If O'Connell were to take over as the OC interim head coach, could you explain why so many people are, high, are so high on him? Does it what happened with McVay impact how the Skins will handle O'Connell? And the easy answer to that one is it might. I don't know. I think it probably would, but it depends on how the rest of the season goes. Let's not go overboard here. McVay, you know, was the OC for a couple of years. You started to see what he could do in that role. We don't really know yet with O'Connell. It's only four games into it, so it's a little bit different. But, um, you know, if they're 3-13, and 13, do you really promote a guy from your own staff or do you go outside? So we'll see there. But I've talked a lot about him and discussed the interim stuff on the previous podcast. So I don't want to go over all that. If you want to hear that, it's on Monday's podcast. But as far as what people like, he's a very smart offensive mind. I had one player compare him to Sean McVay with how he sees things and puts it together. I also think he explains it pretty well. And my guess is in front of the group, he's pretty good. Um, I think he gets guys energized about the game plan, and they usually are pretty good. I found him to be smart, and I also see him as someone who knows how to be in charge. This is a little thing, but during practice is open to the media, there's a portion in which cameramen are allowed to shoot. There are some clear rules about when they can shoot and some ambiguous times. You can't shoot anything with formations in it, for example, and certainly no full team stuff. It's not always clear when they're working on formations versus doing a warm-up drill. So sometimes the cameras keep rolling. When that's happened a couple of times, O'Connell has walked to the sidelines and clearly, firmly but politely, asked them to stop shooting. There's a firmness to his voice, and I like that. It's a little thing, but it's also detailed. O'Connell has gleaned info on other team stuff based off social media video feeds. He doesn't want other teams doing the same here. Not a huge deal, but for some reason, I like how he handled it and that he wanted to handle it, and he did. I think it was kind of head coach-ish, if that's a word. All right, Charlie Gaddy at CG101. In your time covering the team, has there ever been a more depressing time than now? Do you think this is rock bottom for the franchise? Do you see things changing for the better or worse going forward? Charlie, it's hard for me to say that if it's the most depressing since I'm not a fan. In other years, there was no social media to gauge a wider temperature of the fan base. But to me, what makes this time different is the lack of hope people seem to feel and the apathy involved. That's the shocking part. There's a 20-year history now under Dan Snyder, and it doesn't include much success. You are your record. In other bad seasons, especially during the 90s and even in the early 2000s, they weren't far removed from success, and they were early in Snyder's tenure. It had been such a good organization that you figured a turnaround was coming soon. What's shocking to me is that last year they weren't close to selling out the home opener, and then this year for a Monday night game at home, the second game of the year, they weren't close to selling out that either. And there were a lot of opposing fans. The TV ratings in town are down. I've heard a lot who express apathy. This is not a good point for the franchise. It might be the most, again, depressing. It might be the most hopeless I felt the fan base has felt. Keep in mind, too, I grew up in Cleveland. I've seen how that situation went as well. And so that's why I say, as far as can it get better? Well, Cleveland has had a bad owner, and they got lucky. Things broke right. They had a couple horrible, horrible years, and then you get a then you end up with a GM who's pretty good because why did he go there? Because they had a lot of assets and they had the number one pick. The Colts have have Ursay. They somehow stumbled into a better situation. Same with the Los Angeles Rams. So anything can happen, but it starts with hiring the right shoot. The Arizona Cardinals were a joke forever. And now they're you know, they're they're not a great franchise, but they're in a better spot. So anything can happen, but it starts with hiring the right people, and that's something Snyder hasn't always done, not throughout the organization. They get enough good people in there to balance the rest. The result is a team that hovers around 500 and then has a year like this. They need to reset the culture, and it's hard to see that changing with Bruce Allen in charge. I think culture starts at the top, and I think the culture here needs to get better, a lot better. Mike53 wants to know, what can the defense do to get more pressure? All right, X and O time. Mike, I've seen the varied looks 
the last two weeks in different linebacker blitzes and stunts. A lot of them have been working, except that the coverage doesn't hold up. I saw one in which the end and tackle slant inside and the other end loops around. It was working, but the ball was out in 1.84 seconds. Saw a blitz by Cole Holcomb last week that, that on, a, on, I think it was the fourth down play, um, or third down play that should have worked. He stutter stepped a little bit at the end because I think he thought Daniel Jones was going to throw, but the coverage didn't hold up either. So it was it ends up in the completion, but it was a design. I liked the design of it. Um, so Fabian Moreau gives up a lot of quick throws all the time in press because he gets off balances at the first step of receiver. That makes it hard to send certain stunts and blitzes. It's not just him, but he's you know but he was coming off a bad game. I haven't seen any slot corner blitzes that I can recall. I don't think Minuski was aggressive at all in the first couple of games with stunts or anything else or blitzes. He And I think sometimes guys need to disguise things better. He may as well be aggressive now. What the hell do you have to lose? But to get home more frequently, they must have better coverage. They'll most assuredly have a new coordinator in 2020, but they'll also need another corner and a damn good one next year as well. They need guys to hold up on that end. That hasn't happened. They need guys who win quicker. That hasn't happened either. Again, you want to look at the draft. The guy to keep in mind is Chase Young from Ohio State. I'm biased because I see him play all the time. The guy's terrific, and he he's going to be a top a top three pick next next April. Um, all right, on to the fun part. Steve Hauser wants to know what kind of wood do you use for smoking chicken? Easy apple. All right, next one. Josh Stack wants to know, and this is going to lead into my next conversation or my next guest. Josh Stack wants to know pulled pork. My barbecue chops come from 10 years in North Carolina. Half the state will stir in a vinegar sauce. Once the pork is pulled and not add anything else. The other half will not sauce the meat at all, but leave it up to the consumer to add their own. Where do I fall on this spectrum? Josh, I do not stir in any vinegar-based sauce after making the pulled pork. I do use an injection that has some vinegar in it, yes, as well as a glaze that has some vinegar in it. I put that on the final hour, and again, that has some vinegar in it, but the pork does not have a strong vinegar flavor to it. It has a really good flavor, a good smoke. It's a lot of flavor. I leave it up to whoever's eating if they want to add their own sauce. And sometimes I make my own barbecue sauce that, yes, has a vinegar base to it. But to be honest, my family usually doesn't add any sauce and they don't want any. I have tried to build an extra layers of flavor and I think the glaze does that well. Again, I will add some of the glaze after I pull the pork. It's not a sauce, but there is vinegar in it and it is, it is damn good. Anyway, that's it for the Therapy Thursday portion of the podcast. I hope that helps. Now, it's on to some more Barbecue Talk with Chef Mel. All All right, I'm back for another week with Chef Mel. Tell us, Mel, before we get going, where people can find you. Yes, sir. Chef Mel at 12 Tables on Instagram. And I am Chef Mel on Instagram. And 12 Tables is uh, .com. Okay, there we go. Got all that out of the way. And yes, sir. Another great meal today. Uh, very spicy shrimp. Excellent. Anyways. I almost forgot uh, my whole website and everything. All my information. Oh. <laughs> nah, I'm okay. good. Okay. All right. So let's get, I want another more barbecue talk. And we're going to get a couple other topics in a minute, but barbecue first. One of the things I was curious from your end, and I think you, you always see this on some of these shows and when you're doing it, injection. What's your rule of thumb on injection? What meats do you like to inject? What would you say don't inject? Mm. What meats would you not inject? I like to inject all of them. I want to like, you know, put that flavor into all of them. So right. I really don't have a preference on what meats, but I actually like to just inject them with all the flavor I can. So, do you do you inject even into your ribs? Yes, I would love to, but I don't. I don't normally do that on ribs. And why? Because that's the one that I don't, I don't too. Yeah, I don't. Because I don't, I don't feel like that. it needs it. it. It don't. But you know, what I'm saying you could you could try it out and see how. It, but it's it's not even worth it. You know, you got to do it. What 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 it for you a good keto an injection. What, what like what do you like? What's your do you have a go to injection? I know it's going to depend on the meat, depend on the meat. Depend but. on the meat, but like I said, like you just you you want to get a good injection that has a flavor that you want to go prefer the, the prefer meat that you, you that you're using. Um, that's something that I go by. Like I like if I'm doing like a, I want a spicy like you know some like like that spice. I use like a little bit of Cajun uh, injection. You know different you know different things I put sure. in there, just to uh, spice it up. What about you? <clears throat> 
it depends on what I'm cooking too. And then I try to get, try to do a theme with it too. Mm -hmm. And if you want some sort of like, if I'm doing, you know, depending on the ham, there might be like, you sometimes you put a syrup glaze on it and then maybe inject something that has a little bit of that, that flavor inside there. Mm -hmm. Um, with the pork, it's going to be something apple based, you know, cider, apple cider, cider I like vinegar. Apple. I like that in my wood, you know, the apple. Oh, I like the apple wood. Yeah, the apple wood, man, that, that pecan too. Both apple and pecan I'll mix together as well yeah and you know I sometimes cherry with that oh yeah you want that yeah. cherry in there too yeah the different flavors a absolutely so so that's that's <clears throat> so you would do anything like and that's what I've always because like it's funny because like a couple years ago I'd see stuff where they're like you know um there was this like you're not supposed to inject in pork and all that and I was like I'm watching these barbecue pitmaster shows <laughs> and they're injecting pork it's like well if they're doing it I'm doing I it I mean like I inject the pork with like a garlic and herb you know like a type of you know flavor in there mm -hmm. that's what I, I mean that's right. my preference I like mm -hmm. I put it there because that garlic would be so good in that that pork <laughs> yeah and, and then the herbs in there just whoo the herbs I'll do that. I'll do more of the herbs with um, like a turkey or chicken mm. um, do you brine usually not all the time. Is you know. it? Does it depend on? Because like for me, it depends, if it's like, a bird, I'm using. You know, it. it's all up. See, the thing about when you get into the barbecue and things, it's levels to it. It's levels of where you want to take this right. meat and how it's like just smoking. It's like levels where you want to really get to, get to it. Like it's a science to it. You want to make there sure that <laughs> you get everything right to get that perfect, you know, meat brine, everything that you want on there for that flavor to come out. And people don't really like recognize that. People just go in and eat, but they don't really right. understand the process of how these barbecue guys really take the time out. It's like a farmer. You know, you go on a farm, you see all the vegetables and all that stuff, you see all of the you know the pro you know, everything out there, but you never see the, the time of how much they put that work in to get all that stuff together for you. It's amazing. It's, yeah. if I did the pulled pork last week, it's ten hours smoking, but then there's also prep time that goes into it and you have to get it you know you like that beer can you like that you smoke like the, beer can yeah chicken. you like that yeah I do it's because it keeps it moist but and you I, haven't you know what you haven't even you know sent me over no no beer can chicken anything like well, that well I did a couple years ago when I brought it here oh. the problem is there's never any left that's the problem that's a good See, thing you gotta that's, put something to the side for but me, even like that with like and I don't always brine when I'm doing the beer can chicken because like, to be honest it typically doesn't need it because the, the moisture from the can keeps it so moist if I do sometimes I'll do a quick brine with mm -hmm. it um, but I don't have to because the, the 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 natural. Now, how long how long do you like like to brine? You know your meat. Depends, it depends. Like some of those quick brines can be four or five hours. It depends on the size of the chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, are you doing a whole chicken? You doing just chicken breast? Whatever. So the with the chicken with the whole chicken, I like to do it overnight if possible. Yeah. Um, but at least it's got to be at least four to six hours, and then to overnight. But I definitely like to recommend anybody to you know do the chicken. Definitely the chicken. It's yeah. gonna come out amazing. It, it almost always does. And any any bird, I'm gonna brine. And and the other stuff is is. But what about I want to talk about vegetables. What's your you know, vegetables grilled are to me are awesome. Oh man, they're amazing, man. Definitely the peppers and onions and uh, zucchini and squash, asparagus, definitely a go to. Now, when you want the asparagus, you still want that crisp, but you still want that flavor in it too. So you drizzle a little olive oil on the salt and pepper, you add your lemon to it. You know, it's your preference on which you, how you want that asparagus to taste as well too. But um, it's really a simple salt and pepper thing with the, with the, uh, with the vegetables and they come out amazing off the grill oh yeah. man how long do you typically grill them to get the when <clears throat> you just want to get like about like five minutes you know until like you you start seeing them curl up a little bit you want to just take them off because you don't want to overcook your vegetables keep in mind it contains water right so all the vegetables which is good but you know you want to take them off so they can actually rest for a little i like to rest all my food everything that i cook i always like to just like sit, sit to the side for a minute so it can actually get the flavors to come you know come in and say hello <laughs> there you go so um that's very that's really good i love vegetables on there and i like i'll be honest like one of my favorites are tomatoes tomatoes on there because you mm. get them because they pop when, oh yeah they pop when you with a little cherry oh, yeah. to little cherry tomatoes and you put them on there for how you know five ten minutes and they pop when you when you bite into them and it's mm. and it's like it gives it like a little pow of flavor that's that's what i like among the other things and you know everything else there the, my one of my favorites is grilled chicken tacos where you grill everything, the the avocado, Ooh. the onions, the tomatoes, the peppers, everything is grilled. Sound, that sounds really, that sound really is good. Grilled. It is really good, but that's what that's one of my favorites, and it's a good middle of the week go to meal. One one more thing here, they got New England Patriots coming up this weekend. 
you're thinking clam chowder. What do you? What else you think? Oh man, I'm I, I'm talking lobster, man. You want to do? You know, I'm gonna do like some lobster as well. I do have some lobster tacos. Lobster tacos would be like one of my go-to's. I love that. You know, with some cilantro, you know, a pico and everything on there. It's delicious and the, and the corn. You gotta have the corn. T- you know, you gotta have. Do you grill the corn you and got, shave it you, off in you, there? Yeah, you got to. You got to. That that'd be amazing with it. It tastes really good, and uh, you know. Prepare like what taco you you know what shell would you use? I use corn. Yeah. Um, I don't do too much flour, but I like the corn on there. It's really played well with the uh, with the lobster. But yeah, they, you know they got New England coming up. So and you do some good clam chowder too. You don't got to do too much with it. Just you know make a good sauce with it. And that's that white wine. <laughs> there you go. I'm getting hungry every time we talk about this. So man, let's go eat. All right, all right, Mel. <laughs> thanks a lot. All right, thank you. That's it for this week. Thanks to Dwayne Haskins and Chef Mel for joining me. And thank you, as always, for your questions, as well as for listening. Hang in there.